Good evening. If you'll turn to Isaiah 40, this will be our meditation for tonight. Isaiah chapter 40. And as you turn there, I'd like you to imagine for just a moment that you're sitting in your living room. It's a nice evening. You might even be kind of trancing out watching TV. You're enjoying your favorite television show. And suddenly, everything goes black. No TV, no light. Even the background sounds like your refrigerator running go completely silent. And the shock of the sudden silence and darkness you go fun, fumbling your way into the kitchen and you open your junk drawer. You slide the drawer open, you grab a hold of a long cylinder, only to find it's a glue stick. At this point, you're pulling out things at random. You're placing them maybe not so nicely on the counter. And finally, you find this well-sought-after flashlight. You hit the button on the mag light, and nothing. So you continue on, and you play this game of guess and release until you find your batteries. You open the package, you slide them in, and you hit the button again, and still nothing. Pop the top off, you flip them around, you stick them in, and you hit the button and voila! We finally have light. Let there be light. I want to read a verse, John 14, 1. Jesus said, do not be troubled, trust in God and trust in me. Let's dive into Isaiah 40 tonight. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. And her warfare is ended and her iniquity is pardoned. That she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Tonight, I'd like to talk a a little bit about the power of negative thinking. The power of negative thinking. Norman Vincent Peale had a controversial book in the 50s called The Power of Positive Thinking. The secular culture of its day absolutely hated it because quite frankly, Norman Vincent Peale was a pastor and it was quite faith-based. The religious culture hated it because the secular world hated it. Peel was a pastor. He also published the guidepost booklets. When we came into this chapel here and we were cleaning up the loft up there, I found three or four, maybe even five cases of old guideposts. I remember reading them at my grandmother's house years and years and years ago. Honestly, I read the book called The Power of Positive Thinking, and quite frankly, I enjoyed it quite a bit. I have to admit that Norman um, is a bit over the top in the book. But as a writer, as a pastor, as a presenter, many times to drive a point, you have to be a little over the top just to drive that point home. But I think it's important that we do a bit of contrast analysis of this idea of positive and negative thinking. Let's continue on to verse 3. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. We know this is the fulfillment of The fulfillment of this was John the Baptist also points to the deity of Jesus Christ here. 
as John was the fulfillment of verse 3. Verse 4, every sh valley shall be lifted up, every mountain a hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Too many times today I think that we have forgotten how to think or to think critically. I think that many of us, we have be completely become atrophied in our brain as far as being able to do any kind of critical style thinking. You'll find throughout all of the scriptures, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, that they used poetry. And when we think of poetry today, we think of rhymes and rhythm. However, Hebrew poetry did not work exactly like our rhymes that we have in English. Hebrew poetry was a vehicle for teaching, for prophecy. It was for archiving wisdom. In Hebrew poetry, instead of using rhymes, they used rhythm, repetition, metaphors, and contrasts to drive a point home in a vehicle that was easy to memorize. In verse 4 here, we have a contrast of the low valleys and the high mountains and the rough being made smooth. In my vision here, I wanted you to think of this biblical method tonight to consider the contrast between positive and negative thinking. Verse 5, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see together, for the month of the Lord has, or the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, all beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. If you come over here in the spring, you walk outside the front doors here and you look over to the left, you'll see also on the right, you'll see these beautiful irises uh, that have been planted, that James planted years ago. And if you show up on the right Sunday morning, you'll be able to enjoy the blossoms of the flowers of these irises. But it seems like if you come one week late, because irises only bloom for a very short time, one week late, you have completely miss the irises blooming. They wither away just one week later. This temporariness of flowers is, con is contrasted here in this Hebrew scripture, in this Hebrew poem, contrasted with the permanence of God's word. And truly how short our life is. I know I'm getting old because it seems like any time you can say, it seems like only yesterday that I did this or that, it means you're getting old. Verse 9, go on up to the high mountain, O Zion, herald the good news, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up. Fear not, say to the cities of Judah, behold your God, behold the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And he will tend his flock like a shepherd and he will gather the lambs in his arms, and he will carry 
them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. We have a great contrast in this book. We have the major prophecies of wars and judgments and sickness. But after all these negative thoughts, all these negatives upon negatives upon negatives, you come to a chapter like verse 40. You come to a chapter like this. Passages of victory, of redemption and reward. Positive. In re reading Isaiah, it can always seem to, to you at times that you're going up this roller coaster, that there's these contrast after contrast of negative, 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 and then positive. Verse 12, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with his span, that's to do this, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure and weigh the mountains in scales and the hills in the balance. Isaiah also spends some time here in chapter 40 bringing out attributes of God. As we studied in our systematic doctrine class that Tyler taught most of, we have here the omnipresence of God, that God is truly everywhere. Verse 13, who has measured the spirit of the Lord or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? Whom and who made him understand? Who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? We have the divinity of the Holy Spirit here in his omniscience, that God is all-knowing and also God's perfect justice. Things are just because they are in accordance to God's nature. Verse 15, Behold, the nations are like a drop in a bucket, and they are counted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastland like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are the beasts enough for burnt offerings. All nations are nothing before him and they accounted by him as less than nothing in emptiness. I truly believe as believers that we have to be on guard because social, political, economic systems throughout all of history mimic and set themselves up as religious systems. As the pharaohs in Egypt were worshipped, even Mao in China is enshrined like a Buddha. Mammon is a symbol that you could say looks an, awfully lot, uh, an awful lot like capitalism. And too many believe that there is one candidate that can truly save America. We have to be on guard against this. Pardon me for quoting a band called Megadeth, a band of my generation. And although Dave Mustaine eventually proclaimed Jesus Christ as a savior, when he wrote this lyric, he was not a believer. But even he could see this truth in his days before he knew the Lord. In the song Symphony of Destruction, he makes this line, you take a mortal man, you put him in control, you watch him become a god, and see people's heads a-roll. Always keep in mind that in contrast to God, all nations are a drop in the bucket. Now we are coming upon Christmas, and this verse will be everywhere. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Because this is why political systems, social systems, economic systems seem to be what people gravitate towards to as their religion when they devoid themselves of God is because it is following the pattern of what Jesus is. He is king. And the government of the world is upon his shoulders. Now we as believers, we are called to be missionaries, not revolutionaries. Our revolution truly will come with the coming of our king. Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compared with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts it it for silver chains he who is it too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot he seeks out a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not move do you not know do you not hear has it not been told to you from the beginning have you not understood from the foundation of the earth it is he who sits on the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spread them like a tent to dwell in, who bring princes to nothing and make the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble, to whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power not one is missing why do you say O Jacob and speak O Israel my way is hidden from the Lord and my right is disregarded by my God have you not known have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the ends of the earth he does not faint he does not grow weary his understanding is unsearchable. Here we have a contrast of the confusion of man versus the understanding of God. I heard a scientist once, and many scientists will say this, generally, especially economic scientists or political scientists, but every once in a while, I think this guy was a physicist that I heard say this. And he was talking about science, that science is not about finding truth or reality. It's about finding useful models to do things with. It's not whether it is true or whether it is accurate. It is whether I can reproduce it and make a pattern out of it. This particular guy, he says, as he has been studying and doing his thing with physics, I believe he was a physicist, he says that he's no less confused than the day that he first started studying physics. But he's only found more complex and elegant ways to be confused. Why would we put faith in man like a scientist or a politician? Why would we put our faith any more into a rock or something like silver or gold? Or why would we put our faith, if we were poor, into wood? Or why would we put our faith in green little pieces of paper? Verse 29, he gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary and young men shall fall exhausted. 
I began our night tonight with a little thought about a little story about finding a flashlight in the dark where you inserted your batteries the wrong way, where you took and you had your negatives and positives in the wrong order and found that things don't work when that happens. I followed it up with John 14.1 where it's, Jesus said, don't be troubled, the negative. Trust in God with the positive and trust in me. If you have your negatives and positive thinkings in the wrong order, just like when you put the batteries in something incorrectly, what happens? If you have your negatives and positives in the wrong order, at best, things just don't work. At worst, it can fry everything inside. It can be extremely damaging. The Bible does teach, as Norman Vincent Peale did point out in his book, it does teach about positive thinking. However, the Bible does talk also about negative things that come in our lives. We've been studying oracles and oracles of Isaiah that both teach the blessings and the cursings. The Bible absolutely is not a book of all positive things. You absolutely cannot just think warm, fuzzy feelings and think everything will be all right or live in denial of things that are around you. But if you think of all the negative things and think of those only, it'll be destructive to you. We have to put our batteries in the correct way. Our focus has to be on the positive. It is our direction. It is where we look and where we go through life. The negatives we keep behind us, they are the things that we pass over, around, or through. And we have to keep moving in the positive direction. And we'll end with the final verse, setting our positive direction. But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Apply these things to our hearts tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.